So good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. It's hosted by the Center for ADHD Awareness Canada. So our webinar tonight is on ADHD in older adults. Uh, it's presented by Dr. Cass uh, Kathleen Nadeau. Uh, Dr. Nadeau is the founder and clinical director of the Chesapeake Center for ADHD Learning and Behavioral Health, one of the largest private ADHD specialty clinics in the United States. She has been studying older adults for the past several years, interviewing older adults with ADHD across the country, as she works on her upcoming groundbreaking book, Still Distracted After All These Years, Dr. Nudeau is the author of over a dozen books on ADHD and is a frequent lecturer, both nationally and internationally. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box uh, and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. So with that said, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Nudeau. Very good. Well, I hope everybody can see my shared screen and welcome to everybody. I'm, I'm delighted you're here and I'm really happy to, to have an opportunity to talk with you. I am not seeing my entire slide, so I'm wondering if you're seeing my entire slide. Uh, yes, I can see the entire slide. Okay, for some reason I'm not. Okay, and let's see if this forwards it. It does. Okay, we're good. All right, I'm on two different screens. So, welcome to everybody. Um, as uh, Juanita introduced me, I have been working on a book about older adults with ADHD for a long time. I've interviewed about 150 adults um, over the course of the past several years, and I've been working on writing about them. And the reason I'm doing this is older adults is a long, long neglected group of people with ADHD. And um, I've been working with people across the whole lifespan. And, and one of the things I've always tried to do is to identify who are we ignoring and how can we start paying better attention to them and giving them um, the information and the help that they need. And so over the years, I was one of the very first people to pay attention to adults with ADHD back in the mid, early to mid 90s. And then I turned my attention to girls and women with ADHD because they have been underdiagnosed and long ignored. Uh, and this is this is a project that I have been working on for a long, long time. And I wanna share it with you tonight. Um, there seems to be somebody in the waiting room and I'm not able to admit them while I'm screen sharing. Um, let's see. That's I, okay, I, I have it, I'll, yeah. I'll take care of that, yeah. Okay. So. All right, very good. So let's go ahead and get started. I'll be talking for about an hour and then we'll take a few questions. And I'm you know, very happy to, um, answer your questions as best I'm able. So let's just dive in. So let me tell you a little bit about the project that I undertook. Um, first, I wanted to look at what the research tells us about older adults. And the fact of the matter is research doesn't tell us much of anything, uh, unfortunately. Um, there is remarkably little research on older adults with ADHD. So we know uh, if you read the research that the incidence of adult ADHD is almost twice as high as the incidence of ADHD in older adults. I don't think that is true. That's just what the research tells us. And so I think one of the reasons I wanted to write this book is to just be able to promote greater awareness. 
so that we're not getting false statistics. So are the challenges different when we're older with ADHD? That's something that I really wanted to explore. Are, are they, does it get better with age? Does it get worse with age? Nobody really knew. And sort of what are the primary issues that are faced by older adults with ADHD? Um, just by way of introducing myself a bit more, um, although it isn't the reason I got into the field, there are many, many people with ADHD in my family. And so I, I know it from a very personal perspective, not just from the perspective of a clinical psychologist. So one of the important issues, and so many people, this is one of the first questions they ask is, if I have ADHD, am I more likely to develop dementia? Am I more likely to develop Alzheimer's? And before we had done any research about it, I talked to many psychiatrists who believed that that was probably the case. Just thinking that, well, your brains are already uh, compromised in some way because your prefrontal lobes are less active, you have lower levels of dopamine, so you're probably more susceptible to cognitive decline as you get older. And the good news is that it is absolutely not associated either with myocognitive decline or Alzheimer's. Myocognitive decline is basically a, a precursor to Alzheimer's. So that's, that's very relieving and important that we all understand it. So ADHD symptoms basically seem to remain pretty stable across the lifespan. Um, uh, Dr. Nadell, your screen is not changing. The slides aren't changing, so I'm not sure if you're actually changing them. Um, I just clicked over, I'm on slide number four, and that's not what people are seeing? No. What, what are you seeing? So I'm seeing overview of my project to explore. Okay, I don't know why they're not changing. They're changing in my view. Oh, you know what? It said my screen sharing is paused. Okay. And I do not need mine. Okay, let's try it now. Okay, yep. It's changed. Is that working? Okay, yep. I'm, I'm not sure why but um, be that as it may, now it's working and I'm so glad. Okay, so as I was it's saying, that it, thank goodness not making us more vulnerable for Alzheimer's or the myocognitive decline that precedes, typically precedes Alzheimer's. So, one of the studies found that measures of executive functioning were the most accurate way to diagnose ADHD in adults. And what does that mean? I assume an awful lot of you know all about executive functioning, but in the early days, we paid much more attention to hyperactivity, to impulsivity, to distractibility. And what this is saying is when we're exploring ADHD in older adults, this whole set of cognitive functions we call executive functions are really the best measure to take if we're trying to diagnose ADHD in adult. And what are executive functions? Executive functions are the higher level cognitive functions. They take place in the prefrontal lobes of our brain. Uh, and that is, of course, one of the areas of the brain most affected by um, ADHD. And those executive functions have to do with organizing and planning, follow through, time management. It also has to do with impulse control. It also has to do with emotional regulation. But moreover, when we're talking about executive functions, it's just being able to manage your life in some sort of functional way. So we need to develop better, more appropriate diagnostic tools 
for older adults with ADHD. We don't, no one has really developed a questionnaire to diagnose older adults with ADHD. And it's very much needed. And actually what I have done is I've given all of the 150 adults I interviewed a questionnaire to fill out. And the questionnaire was developed by myself just based on my clinical experience, but we are now doing research to figure out which items on that questionnaire really seem to be discriminating the best in describing older adults with ADHD. And that questionnaire is going to come out in my book. And I hope that it triggers research to validate the questionnaire, to norm the questionnaire, so that we will have a better tool to diagnose um, older adults with ADHD. Um, unfortunately, most memory clinics aren't even thinking about ADHD when people come to them in older age. They're thinking about dementia. And there's just a woeful lack of education for most physicians because ADHD, even among adults, is one of the five most common psychiatric conditions. And it's much more common than bipolar disorder, for example, and yet all uh, adult psychiatrists are trained in diagnosing and treating bipolar disorder. There's just a real gap that badly needs to be filled. So my belief is that many older adults are going to memory clinics with never diagnosed ADHD. They're in their late 60s or in their 70s. They're worried about their memory. The first thing they think about is some sort of dementia and they go to memory clinics. And unfortunately, the memory clinics are not designed or set up to really consider ADHD in older adults. Um, I'll tell you a story later about a woman in Florida who was incorrectly diagnosed and treated with medication for Alzheimer's when in fact she had never diagnosed adult ADHD. So one of the most important things, if you're wondering if you may have ADHD yourself or, or if you're concerned about an older adult in your family, is that ADHD is just highly, highly genetic. If there are children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews uh, diagnosed with ADHD, then the ADHD diagnosis becomes much more likely for you because of the strong genetic component. So as I've talked to you about a little bit earlier, it is not associated with greater risk for cognitive decline. However, there does seem to be an association between ADHD and Lewy body dementia. In fact, uh, they have done retrospective studies uh, with people with Lewy body dementia and talking to family members of those people and a significant number of them uh, diagnosing retrospectively, of course, seem to have had lifelong ADHD. So what is mild cognitive impairment? Uh, it's it's a cognitive complaint and for it to be taken seriously, somebody in your family, somebody that knows you well has to corroborate it, that there really is a uh, decline in your cognitive abilities. Um, I wish that it had become standard or will become standard medical practice as you know, we have all sorts of tests that we take every year, every several years as we get older. And I really think there should be a cognitive screening so that we have a baseline and can measure if you come back five years later and you're really having significantly more cognitive issues. At this point, um, we don't have that. With mild cognitive impairment, in general, you're functioning well, your impairment is minimal, and there's no real medical cause for the cognitive impairment. So how does that differ from 
ADHD, it's, there's a big difference because ADHD is not a cognitive decline. It's always been there. Maybe it wasn't recognized. I mean, so many people say, I thought this was just the way I was. My family thought this was just the way I was. Uh, nobody thought it could be ADHD, but those kinds of issues that we now associate with ADHD have always been there, whereas with mild cognitive decline, there's a, a significant noticeable change that family members are noticing and often the older adult themselves. Um, ADHD is characterized by what one person called Swiss cheese memory, and that is not just a general poor memory, but just unpredictable gaps in memory. Um, and those gaps vary from day to day. Uh, with Swiss cheese memory, you might be able to remember the name of something, a term, um, a word today, and you might not be able to remember it tomorrow. Uh, people with ADHD often forget what they're about to do, what they intended to do. And this is really a, a symptom of distractibility that they started thinking about something else while they were walking into the kitchen for something. Uh, people with ADHD misplace things, again, often because they're thinking about something else. They're not thinking about, this is where I put my glasses down. This is where I put my car keys. Forgetting words and names of things. And many people with ADHD report that their brain just suddenly, for no particular reason, seems to go blank. And sometimes that even happens in conversations. Um, people with ADHD need a lot more structure and support. They need more planners, more reminders to keep them on track. And they may, as they get older, find it harder to learn new things. So I did a survey of the older adults, the 150 older adults that I interviewed, and I'd like to report on what they said were their biggest ADHD challenges. And as far as I know, this is the first time older adults have ever been interviewed or surveyed about what's troubling you about your ADHD in your later years. And by far, by far, the biggest complaint was, I just can't seem to get anything done. Many, not all, but many of the adults that I talked to were retired and they told me, you know, I thought once I wasn't working, I would be able to get plenty of things done that I've put off. And they were talking about a whole range of things, hobbies, interests, plans, friendships, activities, volunteer work, all the things they dreamed of getting done when I have plenty of time. And they sort of tell me, I literally don't know where the time goes. I feel that I've been busy all day, but I haven't accomplished anything that I want to accomplish. They, not surprisingly, and this is true of people with ADHD at all ages report, I procrastinate, I'll do it later. Um, that it's, it's harder to get yourself to do something that requires planning, organization, concentration, um, not being self-disciplined. I, I thought I would have plenty of time to exercise once I retired, but I just can't seem to get myself off the couch. A lot of trouble getting started on tasks. And once they get started, a lot of trouble staying on tasks. Um, I just recently talked to a fellow who said, you know, I've had a shed in my backyard for years. It's chaotic inside. Uh, it needs repair. Some of the wood is rotting. Um, I'm retired now. My wife has been asking me to go out there and take care of it. And it's been over a year and I haven't done a single thing about it. Um, and generally just reporting I have a general lack of motivation. I'm not happy with not doing much, but I can't seem to get myself to do much. So this was the second greatest challenge that people reported. Uh, and this wasn't one I was necessarily expecting, but many different types of reports that all came down to my emotions are just not under good control. And this leads to problems in a marital relationship. This leads to 
family conflict. This sometimes leads to losing friendships um, due to frustration or irritation. What, what I found is that more males reported that they would become unexpectedly angry, that I'm just generally irritable. People are just driving me crazy. I'm irritated. I get angry in traffic. I get angry when things don't work. Um, and sometimes having an emotional meltdown, whereas females reported to me more, I just feel overwhelmed. I feel anxious. I don't know how to get started on things. I feel I'm going to let people down, let my family down, let my friends down, more of a feeling of anxiety. But nobody feeling calm and happy in general. The third greatest challenge had to do with time issues, um, difficulty just managing time throughout the day. Um, I try to set a routine. I never seem to stick to it. I don't even remember what my routine is. I get to the end of the day. I haven't straightened up. Uh, I haven't planned a meal. I haven't exercised. I haven't been in touch with friends. I don't know what I've been doing. I think there's an awful lot of time being spent online or sitting in front of the television watching Netflix simply because it doesn't take much effort or planning or organization to do that. Um, some people reported having a lot of trouble being flexible in their daily routine, which is a different kind of problem. I remember one woman saying, I almost don't want to run into friends when I'm out on a walk because I've got my routine and if I don't stick to it exactly, then I'll get off track and I'll forget my whole routine. And so I don't want to stop and visit because I'm only supposed to be out walking for 30 minutes and then I've got the next step in my routine. So, so sort of opposite ends of the continuum, either I have no routine at all or it's so hard for me to stay on my routine that I cannot be flexible in that routine. Lots of time management difficulties in general, and, and just kind of a general lack of awareness of the management of time. The So many of the older adults that I've been concerned about have sort of no routines at all. They don't have meal times. They don't have bedtimes. They don't have get up times. They just are sort of living in space in a way that doesn't feel good to them. This one really surprised me. The fourth greatest challenge that they reported was what I refer to as remnants of hyperactivity. Very few of them would be labeled actually hyperactive in their 60s and 70s, but many of them reported, I just can't seem to relax. I feel restless. I feel like I need to be doing something. I'm sort of moving around my house, but not really accomplishing much. Many of them talk about difficulty falling asleep because my brain just won't slow down. Uh, just lots of random thoughts whirling around in my head. Um, lots of people report, I talk too much and I turn people off and talking too much is a form of hyperactivity. Uh, and much more common in adults once they're no longer really physically hyperactive. I talk too much. I don't slow down and let other people talk. So I'm talking at people rather than talking with them. Um, and, you know, this is another aspect of hyperactivity of just needing to be constantly doing something. And so I start too many things and don't finish most of them. I just can't relax. I need to keep going, going, going. And the fifth greatest challenge that they reported had to do with people issues. I've talked about this a little bit in relation to the hyperactivity, but many of them aware that I think women more than men worrying that they're going to be judged by other women because I can't keep up with the social routines that the other women I know do. I forget to send thank you notes. 
I forget to contact people. I get out of touch with people. I can't keep my house straight. I can't invite people over because I can't keep my house straight. And I feel really misunderstood. I feel that they don't have any idea that it's my ADHD and that I don't have a lot of control over it. Um, a lot of people said I really, I miss social cues. I don't listen well because somebody says something that reminds me of something I want to say and all of a sudden I'm just thinking about how to say what's on my mind instead of listening to the person that's talking to me. Um, I use the wrong tone of voice and sometimes that tone of voice might be a voice of irritation or my voice is too loud because I want to jump into the conversation. Um, sometimes I think say the wrong thing it just sort of leaps out of my mouth without my intending to hurt anybody's feelings and I miss social cues. I, I realize after the fact, oh no, I did it again. I put my foot in my mouth or I talked way too much. So those are the top five challenges. I be In the little time that we have for q and I'd be very interested to know if some of people listening tonight would agree with these top five challenges if, if these are issues that you're you're dealing with. So I just want to tell you a funny story uh, and this is an actual story from one of my clients and I often tell this story because I call it the intersection between ADHD and Alzheimer's and the story is this. I was working with a young woman whose parents met and married, and they were married probably for about five minutes, just long enough to get pregnant with her. And her two parents were utterly incompatible. Her dad was a very hippie-ish, back in the day, fellow with ADHD. Her mother was a very focused, driven, hardworking woman who became a physician. So she was telling me that she was going up to Vermont to visit her dad. This was a college student. And she told me this story that she was with her dad and the two of them were driving to see his father, her grandfather. So she explains to me that her father has a pet chicken. I kid you not. And that he refuses to go anywhere without his pet chicken. So he puts the pet chicken in the back seat of the car and they drive about two hours to where his father lives. Now his father has Alzheimer's and they come in the house and he's holding the chicken under one arm when they come in the house and his mother said, I can't believe you brought that damn chicken with you again. I've asked you not to please go put it in the basement. I don't want that chicken running around the house. So he puts the chicken down in the basement very reluctantly. And over the course of the visit, which was several hours long, her grandfather found reasons, whatever they might have been, to go down into the basement to get something. And every time he'd come upstairs, he said, there's a chicken in the basement. Why is there a chicken in the basement? So that's the intersection of ADHD and Alzheimer's. The ADHD dad had no idea how much he was driving his daughter and his mother crazy with his pet chicken. And there's his dad who can't remember there's a pet chicken in the basement and keeps coming upstairs to explain that there's a chicken in the basement. So, they're normal cognitive changes that happen with age. I mean, there just is age-related cognitive decline. And with many people, it's not very severe. You just notice it a little bit. And there are lots of reasons for it. Not as much blood gets to our brain. And it's so incredibly important because of that to do more aerobic exercise as we get older. Our hormones change, of course, and some of you may not know it, but with declining estrogen levels for women, um, their ADHD can become worse because estrogen makes your dopamine receptors more sensitive in the brain. And when you have less, then it's less 
sensitive. And even if you're on medication, you're going to have more ADHD symptoms. Of course, there are poor sleep patterns. I mean, typically older adults have more difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep and a lower quality of sleep, which may very well impact memory patterns. And of course, adequate sleep is one of the most important ways to reduce ADHD symptoms. So we spend a lot of time at my clinic talking about different ways to get better sleep. And I think one of the most important ways to get better sleep is to have a regular sleep routine. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier, that so many people, once they retire, just don't have routines and maybe staying up very late into the night simply because they haven't paid attention to what time it is or they're watching something on the internet or on their television. And so they have very irregular sleep patterns, which of course impacts their memory and their ADHD challenges. So wh what's different for women uh, with ADHD as they age? Well, of course, I mentioned this earlier, um, that hormones have a huge impact on women's ADHD. In fact, on average, perimenopause, and perimenopause is that period that lasts for about a decade in which women's estrogen levels are slowly declining until they reach menopause. And Mary, perimenopause significantly increases ADHD symptoms for women. Um, they often start feeling, I'm dumb, what's wrong with me? Uh, one of the big impacts of lower estrogen levels is word retrieval problems that many women start to experience when they're in their 50s. And stimulant medications aren't as effective. At my clinic, we work with a hormone specialist. Uh, she's not a member of the staff of the clinic, but she is someone that we refer to very frequently when women are going through perimenopause and menopause because hormone replacement therapy, if it's medically appropriate, can be very helpful for women's ADHD symptoms. And so um, integrative medicine can be quite impactful in ways that sort of typically trained physicians don't know. Um, I was very interested to talk with an integrative medicine doc about sleep problems about a week ago. And uh, to my surprise, she mentioned lavender pills as a very safe and effective way to initiate sleep, which was something I wasn't familiar with. So there, there are all kinds of ways to help with onset of sleep. Um, and I think it's so important uh, as older adults with ADHD that one of our biggest focuses should be on how do I get better sleep? Okay, so how can we decrease cognitive decline? Um, these are what at the Chesapeake Center we call the brain healthy daily habits. Um, so one of those is to optimize your diet by eating things that are lower on the glycemic index. And all that means is to uh, eat very low levels of sugar and processed starch. Why do we do that? Because it is sugar and starch that is very related to inflammation in the brain, which of course, can lead to not only lots of different disease states, but also cognitive decline. Uh, it can be very, very helpful in regulating blood sugar levels to not eat for three hours before bed, that sleep will occur more regularly if we do that, and to go for 12 hours without eating. Uh, between dinner time and breakfast time. If you finish dinner at eight and eat breakfast at eight the next morning, that's pretty easy to do. I actually have a number of people that are 
going further than that and trying to only eat within an eight hour period. And usually that eight hour period is between noon and 8 p.m. and are finding that they are much better regulated in terms of their blood sugar levels. And also uh, that their weight is much better regulated as an older adult. Incredibly important to sleep this has eight hours a night. Um, I certainly will give people a pass if they're regularly getting seven hours a night. Uh, melatonin is one um, non-prescription way to get to sleep. CBD oil is another. And as I just learned, lavender is yet another uh, non-prescription way to fall asleep more easily. It's super important to find ways to reduce stress. And I don't know if all of you are aware of the psychiatrist named Lydia Zylowska, but she has developed an entire treatment program to treat adult ADHD that entails nothing but mindfulness meditation. She was at UCLA. Uh, now I believe she's at the University of Minnesota. And she has found in her research that Mindfulness meditation is just as effective in reducing ADHD symptoms as stimulant medication. And not everyone, especially not, <clears throat> excuse me, not all older adults can tolerate stimulant medita medication. So meditation is a good way to go for many people. Exercise, um, hugely important. There is a hormone called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, um, that our brains start producing very quickly after we start aerobic exercise. And BDNF uh, promotes the development of new neurons in the brain, as well as dendritic growth in the brain. And by that, I mean that the physical manifestation of learning is that our dendrites form new connections between our neurons. And aerobic exercise, 20 minutes a day will do it, really promotes that. We now know that um, our brains are capable of growing new neurons and that promotes memory at any age if we get adequate exercise. And of course, engage our brains in stimulating activities. It really, in many ways, is a use it or lose it situation. So there's a very positive side, uh, potentially, uh, for retirement among older adults with ADHD. In fact, I was really struck by what a wide, wide range of different reactions I found to retirement. And some people, said it was the happiest time in their life that raising children, and many of them had raised children with ADHD, had been very stressful. Their jobs had been very stressful. And finally, for the first time, um, they were able to pursue their own interests, finally free to do the things that they wanted and to have less pressure on them. But on the other hand, the challenges of retirement can be significant, and it's it really parallels what young adults with ADHD go through. When we're younger, we have the support of our parents, our teachers, a household that we don't have to manage that is managed for us. And then we leave home, whether we leave home for work or for university or some combination of that. All of that structure goes away. And the biggest challenge is to find out how to manage your own life. And I find that a lot of young adults fail. Uh, they're trying not only to pursue a job or their education, but figure out how to manage their life because they've had very little um, practice doing that. And I find the same kind of thing happens in reverse for many adults with ADHD as they retire, that their job gave them structure. And I was very interested 
Um, I had a client that I worked with for a long time, a lovely woman who had ADHD, and she told me I was much more organized when my kids were home because their structure was my structure. They had to get up at a certain time, get to school at a certain time. I had to be aware of their sports practices, um, all of the things on their schedule, and that kept me on track. And after my kids left home, even though I was still working, things got much looser and it was harder for me to get myself out of bed in the morning. Sometimes I would be late to work because I couldn't get myself out of bed, that the much needed structure was reduced. And then when we retire, um, the structure in many ways um, completely disappears. And I have experienced some of the adults that I've worked with doing much, much better when they moved into some kind of retirement facility that had structured activities. Uh, there are automatically people to chat with. There are meal times. There are activity times. And that begins to take the place of the structure that they had during their working life. So um, retirement can take a real toll on marriages. Um, there's lots of couples that I worked with said that they adjusted to one another when they were both working. We weren't together all the time. And in fact, I interviewed one couple who sort of humorously but seriously said the reason our marriage has lasted is we don't spend that much time together. In fact, they had a vacation home and for many months out of the year, one of them was at the vacation home while the other was in their uh, regular home. And they said that's what has made it easier for us that we don't, we don't have to be living in lockstep. It was the husband in the case of that marriage that had ADHD and his wife was feeling quite burnt out. On the other hand, and I, I think this is wonderful and positive news, I interviewed many, many people who had a very long, positive, supportive marriage, which was almost always their second marriage, and in some cases, their third marriage. Uh, most people had a conflictual, ill thought out and short lived first marriage. And so those are the statistics that we hear about people being more prone to divorce if they have ADHD. But it, there was an, a remarkable number of good, long, supportive second marriages that they, they made a better choice the second or even third time around. There can be real struggles and family issues as we get older with ADHD. I mean, I actually had two middle-aged adults come to me saying, would you please assess and diagnose our mother with ADHD? We are very worried about her, but even more so, we're worried about her taking care of our children. And she's very hurt because we don't feel comfortable with her taking care of our children. And maybe an ADHD diagnosis would convince her there's a good reason not to. And these middle-aged adults told me that she had been looking after their children, one of whom was quite young preschooler and was doing something in the kitchen and didn't even realize that her grandson had left the house and was walking independently down the street I think he was about five years old, and they came home and had to madly look for him. So can you please explain to our mother that she has lifelong ADHD and it's, it's not safe for us to uh, leave our children in her care. Um, there are all kinds of issues that don't just pertain to ADHD. Um, how long is it safe for an older adult with ADHD to live independently, to keep driving a car, to manage their finances, to manage their health care? And it's important to keep in mind that when we have ADHD, I mean, all of these things are challenging as an older adult, but they're much more challenging when ADHD is part of the picture.
So I've, I've worked with several older adults who were living. Uh, this photograph is certainly uh, an exaggeration, but that's a photograph of someone's house. And the older adults that I've worked with were living in circumstances almost that bad. I worked with a man whose wife had eventually left him saying, I just can't live like this. She left him in the house with the chaos and simply moved out. And he came to me saying, I'm afraid I'm going to live in that house until I die because I have absolutely no idea how to clear it out. It's so bad and it's been getting worse for years. I don't know what to do. I worked with another man who was divorced, brilliant man. He had a degree in physics, but he had absolutely no idea how to maintain order in his house. And his son was called down by the landlord from New York saying, we're going to call the health department if you don't come down here and help your father clear out his apartment. It's, it's a fire hazard. It's unsafe for him. And then a third case I'll tell you about is there was a lovely woman who had actually functioned pretty darn well as a single mom with ADHD. She had been an art teacher and raised two daughters and had, had done well until both of her daughters moved away and she became pretty isolated. So she moved near where I worked to be near one of her daughters. Her daughter came to me um, maybe four or five months after her mother had moved into her apartment saying, I'm very worried about my mother. She moved in and she has never unpacked. The walls of her living room and dining room are just packed with boxes, floor to ceiling. She's never unpacked them. She has a card table out. She's not preparing meals. She's basically living on cheese and crackers. She has no schedule. She's up half the night and sometimes sleeps almost until noon. And all of these people were older adults who just couldn't, they didn't have the executive functioning skills to manage on their own. And in all of these cases, they really would be better off and were better off once their adult children arranged for them to not be living alone any longer. Uh, paperwork uh, is the curse of people with ADHD uh, throughout life, and it only gets worse with age. There's so much paperwork, and I don't know if it's true in Canada, but certainly in the United States, where there is no such thing as government provided health care, we are drowning in all sorts of bills and paperwork and records uh, having to do with our medical care, which only grows with age, not to mention trying to manage finances and prepare tax returns and all the things that people were never good at when they were younger and they're certainly not getting better at it um, as they age. Women uh, with ADHD have uh, coined this term and I wonder if you're using it in Canada. I bet you are. The chaos syndrome, which jokingly stands for I can't have anyone over syndrome meaning I live in such chaos that I would never allow anyone in my front door. This is true more often when people are living alone um, and they become socially isolated. They can't have anyone in. Um, they're not organizing a social life. They tend to become more and more isolated, uh, often become depressed. And again, as I said before, um, if people are caught in this kind of a pattern, sometimes it is most helpful to be in some kind of a more organized retirement community. People fall into poor health care and it becomes a downward negative spiral uh, where they're not brushing their teeth. Uh, they're developing dental problems. They're not going to the dentist until they're in agonizing pain. They're not sleeping well. They're not exercising. They're not eating well, and their health is deteriorating. I don't know how many of you have heard about Russ Barkley's work. 
Um, but recently, Russell Barkley, who is a very eminent psychologist in the ADHD field in the U.S., announced that in his extensive demographic research, he found that people with ADHD had much shorter lifespans, significantly shorter. Combined type had almost 13 years shorter lifespan. Uh, inattentive type had eight years shorter lifespan. And this was very directly related to poor self-care, to substance abuse, to untreated anxiety and depression, to accidental injury, to you name it. Uh, it's so important to realize the risks that older adults are running and for family members to step in if they're seeing this kind of um, self-neglect. Financial stress is huge among people with ADHD. Often they go through periods of underemployment or unemployment. They tend to not be good at managing money. Uh, people with ADHD are much more likely to be impulsive spenders rather than savers. And all of this accumulates with age so that people can be in pretty dire straits by the time that they get to retirement years. The, among the adults that I interviewed, quite a few of them were not in dire straits financially, but in every single case, it was because they were married to someone who had been well employed and who had managed the money carefully. It was exceedingly rare that the person with ADHD had done that careful money management. I have often um, encouraged people to work in retirement for a whole bunch of different reasons, one of which is financial stress. Um, when I go to Home Depot, I was there buying a plant yesterday. The woman that waited on me had to have been my age. And it's, it's a very common experience that I'll go into Home Depot and find people of retirement age there. Um, they're supplementing their income for sure, but it also gives them structure and social contact and a lot of good things. So I'm, I'm certainly not suggesting that people with ADHD should work forever, but I think sometimes a part-time job can have all sorts of side benefits in addition to just the additional income. So... I also want to tell you that there, there are plenty of people that have gotten help with their ADHD. Um, almost every person that I interviewed, I only interviewed people that were formally diagnosed with ADHD. These weren't just people that believed they had it. They had had a mental health professional diagnose them. And most of them had tried medication, many of them had benefited from medication. And so I found that quite a few of them were beginning to make positive changes in their life. And for the most part, and I'm, I'm so glad to hear that there are executive functioning courses being offered um, through this organization in Canada because many of them said the thing that's helped me the most is working with a coach either in a group or individually and it's it's much more expensive to do it individually and I think um, in many cases it's more helpful to do it in a group. I've been running an ADHD life skills group for adults, not older adults, but just adults in general and I think that it's very comfortable for them to come together once a week. It's a place where they're not gonna feel judged. It's a place where they can be comfortably themselves and talk about their struggles and not worry about being judged as they begin to develop the life skills to uh, take better charge of their life. To my surprise, I uh, ran into people that were still very hyper after all these years. Um, this was a fellow that um, I interviewed 
who had just never stopped moving and he continued to do downhill skiing. He had been a downhill ski coach. He couldn't stop moving. Uh, and, um, and I think in ways his health was the better for it. Um, and then, and this fellow had a hilarious story. Um, he really did get his support uh, services in motion. He had built up a very successful um, import-export business with his wife, his wife who did not have ADHD. She became very tired of trying to manage him at home and at work. They eventually divorced and he remarried a very quiet woman who was much more domestic than his first wife. And she was the one to bring him his cup of tea and slippers in the evening. And amazingly, he and his first wife continued to co-own and run the business together. Uh, and they were better able to do that because they didn't live together anymore. And this fellow, at the time I interviewed him, was 85 years old. And he said, I intend to work until I'm 100. So there, there certainly are people that still have an amazing amount of energy. And, and I've already told you about this, that there really are people with long-standing positive marriages. And, and I'm happy to bring that news to you. And it wasn't something that I was really expecting to hear about because we hear so many statistics about the likelihood of divorce. Still impulsive after all these years? I only interviewed a few people like this, but I'll bet there are many more people out there than I interviewed. Um, and this fellow um, just said, you know, I've been married umpteen times. I've had umpteen businesses. Um, I really am always just trying to relax and have a good time. Um, maybe I haven't made the best choices in life, but in spite of all of it, he seemed to be enjoying his life with the exception of he was very bothered about his uh, financial stress after a lifetime of bad business decisions. And sadly, there are some people who are still struggling after all of these years. And very often it's because they were isolated and also struggling with anxiety and depression. Alone after all these years, this is something I talk to many people about. And I, I keep beating the drum that if you are very alone, then it would be extremely helpful to find some kind of community where there are automatically activities. It doesn't have to be some kind of super expensive, fancy retirement community. There, there are much less expensive communities that people can belong to. Um, in the Washington area, there are senior communities for lower income people. And there are senior centers where there are lots of activities going on that are low cost or no cost. And I hope those services are available for you too. Feeling lost after all these years, um, very much, and I'm sure this is even worse during COVID and we can um, talk a little bit about that. I think it's been terrible for people who have were living alone before the pandemic and then they were literally in solitary confinement for the past year, which is dangerous for everyone's mental health. But I also found some people amazingly brave, making positive radical changes late in their life. Um, I was just contacted by a woman in her 50s who told me, you know, I've been in a dead-end job, underpaid, boring, frustrating for the past 20 years. And I guess I could keep doing this job, but I've made a decision. I really want to understand my brain, to understand what my strengths are. I've never known what my strengths are. I'm just very aware of what I'm not good at. And I really laud her for coming to Chesapeake and, and trying to make changes. 
and I've I talked to any number of women who left very painful marriages and struck out on their own in later years, in their late 50s and their 60s, and found a much happier life for themselves. And never happier after all these years. Um, and I think it's really important for us to look at what the factors are because I think they're pretty universal. I think this would be my prescription for leading a happy life as a person with ADHD in retirement, that you feel you have a purpose, that you are connected to your community, you're offering help to others in your community. Helping other people is an amazing mood booster. They didn't feel isolated and they weren't really so worried that people that I talked to about financial comfort, I think most of them had pretty modest incomes, but they were released from the stress of work life and they had really actively integrated themselves into the communities they lived in and felt useful and felt connected to other people. So, that is the end of my talk and I'm going to stop screen sharing and I'm very happy to take questions for a few minutes before we stop tonight. That was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadeau. Um, so I do have one question here and so I encourage people if they do have questions to please just type them into the chat box uh, so you can get them answered. Uh, so the first question I have here is uh, I did not have any sleep issues until two years ago. I'm 61 years old and I don't have a problem getting to sleep. Uh, I just don't seem to stay asleep. I have tried hygiene, melatonin, CBT, valerian roots, but haven't had much, if any, success. Wondering if there is a type of specialist I could connect with for help. That's a very good question. And my experience, uh, most sleep specialists focus on sleep apnea. And what this person is describing has nothing to do with sleep apnea. There are a number of things that can help with sleep. Um, sometimes waking up during the night is very normal, very common. A lot of people wake up because they need to go to the bathroom. And sometimes the not being able to go back to sleep has to do with anxiety, that there's nothing to distract us from the things that we're fretting about or worrying about during the day. Um, in other cases, it just has to do with what I call gerbil brain, uh, which is I can't stop my brain from spinning and there's nothing to focus on. So I advise people to do a number of different things. A lot of studies show that exercising during the day has a very important positive impact on sleep. So that is one thing to, to really keep in mind and experiment with. Do I sleep better? Am I able to go back to sleep better if I've exercised? And I'm talking about more vigorous exercise, not just walking around the block. The other thing that is helpful with ADHD brains, if you can't get back to sleep easily, is to give your brain something to focus on. And one of the things that I find helps people get back to sleep is to absolutely not get on your screens. The blue light is just going to wake your brain up even more. Not turn on the light and read, but do something that you can do quietly in the dark. And there are all kinds of podcasts and apps um, that will help you get back to sleep. In fact, um, hilariously, I talked to a woman a couple of weeks ago and her husband has ADHD and he fell in love many years ago with the book Shogun. And he has Shogun in audiobook format. He has read the book numerous times. He knows exactly what's going to happen next, so he doesn't have to listen carefully. But if he can't go back to sleep in the middle of the night, he will put an earbud in one ear. So if he's lying on his side, it's not uncomfortable. And he will quietly listen to Shogun and it puts him right back to sleep. 
my younger granddaughter with ADHD uh, learned a long time ago to put herself back to sleep by listening to recordings of Mr. Rogers. Uh, if anybody is going to help people feel calm and safe, it is a Mr. Rogers recording. So it, you need to think about exercise, give your mind something to focus on so that you're not having so many competing thoughts in your brain and to distract you from, I can't fall asleep, I can't fall asleep. Okay, great. Um, I have another question here. It says, how would you suggest telling your mother who has all of these symptoms to look into this and get help? That's a really, really tough problem. And I have, I've almost never seen a positive outcome um, from family members insisting and often correctly that their parent, their sibling, their uncle, whoever it was, had ADHD because it just feels like name calling. Um, I think it's much better to talk about the difficulties that are being caused by this thing called ADHD without labeling it and working to solve those problems. In the process, the diagnosis may actually take place. Um, but I've, I can't tell you how many people have been dragged into my office by a spouse or an adult child, and I've never seen much good come of it because it just feels like labeling or blaming, finger pointing. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions. So if anyone has any questions, please uh, enter them into the chat box. Um, We'll give it like a minute or so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if there are, are no more questions, um, I would just like to let everyone know that um, I'm expecting within the next several months that my book called Still Distracted After All These Years will be published. It's been written and I'm now um, talking to several publishers, uh, trying to pick one that will be the best one to publish the book. And if you're interested in ADHD in older adults, either for yourself or someone that you're close to, um, this will be the first book um, in existence about or for older adults with ADHD and I hope you check it out. It's going to, just like the title of this talk, it will be called Still Distracted After All These Years. So um, thank you so much for listening. You've been a great and patient audience. I hope you um, got some benefit out of what I had to say and um, I'm going to say good night to all of you. <laughs>